Welcome. This is the Hunger for Justice series. This is episode 30. Um, we've had 30 episodes of the Hunger for Justice series since, since April. Thank you for joining us today. This episode is being recorded and will be available on YouTube for public viewing by the end of the day. This is Black Land Theft with June and Angie Provost. Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, the session is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube for public viewing. We'll be populating the chat box with ways to support today's speakers. That'll be both in the Zoom and in the, in the live cast. If you have questions for today's speakers, we encourage you to ask them. You can post it in the chat box um, or in the Q&A box if you're in the Zoom. Thanks everyone for joining. A Grown Culture is a movement support organization advancing a culture of farmer autonomy and agroecological innovation. And here to introduce the program is Lauren Cardelli, who's the founder of AGC. Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in all over the world today. This is gonna be a very important episode. This is gonna confront a lot of dynamics that are interwoven into our culture, into the way we grow food. And if you don't spend the weekend thinking about this, then I don't, I don't think you were listening. So make sure you take these words home with you and think about it. You know, last week we had uh, one of the elders of the Kalanago tribe talk about the warrior spirit and what it means to fight. Talked about how to tap into that spirit and to fight for change, for equity. Too often we think we're fighting for ending pollution, we're fighting for building soil, we're fighting for this, but like what we're fighting for is the preservation of culture, the culture that has been under attack and continues to be under attack every day around the world. And one of our past um, Hunger for Justice guests, the KMP, which is the Filipino Peasant Movement, they posted something on Instagram yesterday that stuck with me, uh, especially on the eve of this talk with Angie and June, who are just incredibly inspiring. But the post that they, they, they shared said, refuse to glorify resilience, demand accountability. And ugh, fuck, I couldn't go to sleep because I was just up there thinking because the introduction I was going to give to Angie and June was just, you know, bogus. Now, I had to, I had to, I had to center on this and, and really dwell on what that means. And, and so what they were talking, the context real quick is that Philippines are being hit with a series of typhoons right now. And these communities that are affected the most are communities that could have been protected. Policy has been presented to be protected. But government didn't want to. Why? Because they didn't care about the peasant farmers there. So they didn't want you to just celebrate their, their resiliency and their community organizing, right? They wanted you to demand no. This is poor policies. So they ended the post saying, no, we cannot smile when people tell us Filipinos are resilient. Tell that to our peasants who are working, clearing in the fields now, right? Like, and so. I stayed up thinking about this. Like, why do we center resiliency more than justice? Is it possible to even center both? Right, I, then I thought of the legacy of the word resilience in the black community, especially black women, and how this term is used to in one way, like celebrate them, but in other way, like weaponize. And so is it fair to applaud people and their resilience when they're dealing with the unnecessary and unfair burdens of society? Is, it, is, is celebrating their resilience not proactive? And, and that's when I thought of these amazing people who, who, who you're gonna see right now are so alive with energy and love. And every conversation you have with Angie June, and June, you just come back being like blown away and inspired by, by how they face the world, how they love and face each other and how that is contagious and magnetic. And, and I just wanted to like, 
I, you know, so I'm here conflicted because I want to name that their courage is inspiring. I want to name that their courage is something that we should all push for and to find in our own selves. But I also want to like name that we need to hold those in power accountable and that like we ourselves are to blame because we live in a system of white supremacy that is so deep in our society. And it's not just an individual or community, but it's the threads that collectively weave our legacy and our tapestry. And so like for many, they can understand the predatory lending of banks, but the rot goes deeper. It goes deeper into every one of us. It goes deeper into private businesses, the FSA, the USDA, who all discriminated against them. And so many people have heard of the racism in, in the USDA or the predatory loans, but it's hard for other folks listening today to imagine how layered that discrimination is. So I'd love to start this off by, and I'm sorry, cause I was like, wow, that was like too, I hope that wasn't too negative, but yeah. The, <laughs> I wanted to start this off and ask you guys to, to speak to the injustices that you faced in your community and how that was part of a coordinated racist effort to push you off the land. Yeah, uh, we just wanna say thank you, um, Lauren and Julia, everyone at A Growing Culture, Hunger for Justice for having us on this platform today. We're so honored. We're so grateful to be here to share our story. Uh, before getting into the conversation, we'd like to just introduce ourselves. If you don't know who we are, we're multi-generational farm owners. We specifically say farm owners because our, our families, our ancestors have been um, farming these subtropical crops here in Louisiana and in the coast of West Africa since the dawn of millennia. And so we want to give you a sense of the deep roots of agriculture in our family. So we live in New Iberia, Louisiana. Uh, we come from a community of black farmers, black sugarcane farmers. And like so many of us, even when we're pushed out, we still have that passion for growing things, for community development, for family, and for just sustaining our livelihoods. Uh, but that passion does not protect us from exploitation and abuse. Uh, like so many of our counterparts and our family members, we've suffered years and years of discrimination, uh, retaliation and reprisal for just being the people who we are. And so we just hope that by sharing our story that we can galvanize a support group to create real honest change because we're in a state of emergency right now um, going into this conversation, I'm pretty sure the word sustainability and regenerative ag will come up, climate change will come up, um, issues surrounding voters' rights, criminal justice reform, all of those key talking points that may come up today, we need to realize they're going to come up because they're all related to Black farmers and us being driven from the land. Um, and, you know, we're in a real battle here, right? Um, going back to what you were saying before about how it's all a marketing ploy, right? Like glorifying the word resilience and never talking about account accountabil accountability. And so um, those things are done purposefully, right? So that puts onus back on the victim to fix the problem when the victim is not the problem. The problem is the systemic racist policies that govern us. The real legislated apartheid by the government. And so um, just by, we think by giving real honest dialogue to what's happening um, here on the land within having to deal with policies, lawmakers, uh, all of these things, we're hoping for real change. And, and just to kind of give some numbers, I mean, as, as black farmers, we're less than 2% of all farmers. In 1920, there was close to a million black farmers. Today, that number is 45,000. And out of that 45,000, 17 are, are facing foreclosure as we speak. So if we don't rectify this, 
in the five, 10 years, they won't be any more black farmers. And we are bombarded. We are bombarded with a marketing and culture that it perpetuates abuse, right? So we're constantly, as black people, we're constantly bombarded with images of enslavement and Jim Crowism when it comes to agriculture. White Americans don't have that within their ag, you know, communities or their households. We are. That is specifically designed, right? We're told that it's heirs' property is the reason why we're losing so much land, right? But heirs' property, again, is another argument that puts the responsibility back on us to change the problems that are created by the government. Um, and all of these things, when you, when you do that and you glorify the word resilience, which I hate, because to me, resilience is like, I call my flowers in the garden or my plants in the garden resilient when they've gone and I come back from a hurricane and they're still standing. To me, that's resilience, right? Because they're, they're, they're surviving under a situation that is beyond their control. But I can tell you what we are going through, there, this can be fixed by human beings, right? And so um, we are constantly weaponized we are constantly tokenized and it sets up a system of betrayal and it just goes on and on and on and on. And uh, that, 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 that system of betrayal is sort of like that psychological theory of self betrayal where you're bombarded with all of these images and that marketing and you begin to doubt yourself, right? You begin to think to yourself, maybe I don't deserve to farm. Maybe that guy, that county committeeman on the, the podcast who was threatening us, maybe he's better than us in some way, right? Or maybe I can't do this by myself. But then you start to think, you start to realize that these things are, are they are skills, they are, they are skills of, of um, insecurity that are taught to us. And we have to unlearn that. And by sharing our story, by coming in contact with folks like you, it helps us uh, heal in a way, right? It makes us more proactive. And so, um, yeah, it's just we're, we're very uh, passionate about it. And, and, and getting back to what she said, like in this community of just, just in Southwest Louisiana, I mean, there was a community of over 60 Black farmers. That, that have been forced off the land. I mean, that's close to 40 to 50,000 acres that was formed. And, and somebody asked me, well, why the other farmers who were forced out, why they didn't speak? And I was like, you know, that, that is a good question. But you know, it's not easy coming out because you, you are embarrassed, you are like- And you're surrounded by so much violence. Yeah, I mean, like for even now, I mean, we don't go to the store without being with each other. I mean, we still, it's been probably a month and a half, close to two months, we didn't have people outside on our road in front of our home parked and just watching us. We still get that. I mean, it's 2020, but we still get those tactics. So to say it was easy to come out and tell our story, no, it, it wasn't easy. But it was the best thing to ever happen because now I have not only sugarcane farmers in this community that's coming out and speaking to us, but we have farmers all throughout the country. And and, and, and the, the, the mental anguish. anguish that is put on you. I mean, I have a cousin that's been out of farming for 10 years. He came to me and said, June, he said, now is the first time that I ride in front sugarcane fields, which is all over our community. Now is the first time it doesn't affect me. And I, and I thought I was by myself. I thought I was the only person that felt that way, but, it, but I'm not, I mean, and that's what I'm talking about. That's that, that psychological theory of self-betrayal. You're constantly doubting yourself. You, you don't, you do not, you know, act in a way that is healing. And so we really had to unlearn these things and we're still going through that process. Um, there are so many reasons why uh, there, you know, the, the, Black farmers, we are, our numbers are depleting, right? And the main cause is systemic racism. Um, and 
particularly in commercial lending. And so, uh, yeah, I just look forward to getting more into this conversation with you. Thank you guys so much um, for sharing that. I think what might be important for folks to understand is that how far back sugar is in your ancestry for both of you. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, I, our both sets of our families, I mean, like, <laughs> it goes back into the days prior to enslavement, right? So uh, sugar was brought here um, from the Caribbeans, uh, quote unquote, by uh, a group of, uh, I think it was Catholic monks or so, I'm not, I'm not, I can't really remember, but uh, yeah, but I mean, just our history in sugarcane farming goes back quite far um, where it's, it's sort of part of our DNA and our culture here. Uh, and another thing about sugarcane, sugarcane is the number one lobby crop in the U.S., right? Uh, it is considered to be white gold. It, uh, it's created a lot of... Um, I would say inequality for folks where for black farmers, our loss has been to the benefit of white farmers in our community, right? Um, but just that in general, I mean, you know, I mean, you. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's four generations. I mean, to, to not be able to walk the land that my, my grandfather and great grandfather formed behind this is it's, it's so disheartening. I mean, and, and, and to see like land that we formed for those amount of years now being formed by white farmers, that is, that is that's something I would never get over. I, I mean, it's, it's no way that like I'm a four generation farmer, there's no way generational farmers should be all of a sudden dropping like flies and you have white farmers with no experience in farming whatsoever, just popping up in this area and farming thousands of acres. There's a huge problem. I mean, just in Louisiana, in the sugar industry, you have close to 500 farmers and you have only four black farm families left. There's huge, huge issues there. And it's, it's no way that you telling me somebody has been forming all of their life, all of a sudden just forgot how to form, that is not the problem here. I mean, and the numbers of acres are increasing. So you're still getting young farmers just popping up and just starting farming acres. And while here, I'm still a young man that, that want to farm all my life and I'm forced out of business. And getting back to where discrimination, it is discrimination. I mean, for, for us, for a sugarcane farmer, you need between five and $700 or even six to $800 to farm an acre. I was given approximately under $200 an acre. So you have that issue, you have late loans, like in, sugar, in the sugar industry, you need your loan in January or, or February. I was getting my loan sometimes in June. You can't make those months back up. I mean, and, and then not enough. I mean, you, you have all these things that, against you. I mean, the white farmers, only thing they're worrying about here is if a hurricane is going to come, if you're going to catch a drought. We don't have just those worries. We have all these other things on top of that. You know, if, if we are going to get a crop loan, I mean, and it, it tears you up mentally, it tears you up physically, and it's just, it, it has to stop. With, with the history of our family, like, we can give a little bit more detail as to, like, how the farm was developed. So like June was saying, he's like a fourth generation farm owner, right? Uh, but again, our families have been farming since the days before enslavement. Um, and his story, our story of the, the depletion of our own family farmland, uh, of the farms, all of that, there's a common thread in these stories, right? Where you will see that within Black farm families, you will see the, um, 
the passing down of generational debt and not generational wealth. And that comes with uh, over collateralization, that comes with um, destruction of property, um, that comes with improper loan servicing, and it comes with its set of threats that are, you know, need real policy change to address these situations. And at times we treat these these quote unquote civil actions as something that is not criminal. But these issues are human rights violations, right? So whenever you're stopping someone from living their quote unquote best life, you are actually creating a crime uh, against humanity, against that person. Because you're impeding on their life cycle, their ability to grow as a human being. And so that's what's happening to us. And, um, you know, it was in 2015. So we, we went through all of these uh, issues, but in 2015, we decided to fight back. And that was first through litigation. Um, it was through litigation, but because of what you heard in the 1619 podcast, when the quote unquote whistleblower was giving us documents that we were like, man, this is this is proving what we thought all along, right? And um, I mean, but he's no hero, right? He's part of the system, right? And in doing that, we started the process of litigation, but June and I feel like we should not have to wait on our lawyers or the courts to give us justice it also demands a cultural shift and change, right? We have to put pressure on these companies that are buying sugar from these refineries. These lobbyists that are headed to DC, um, you know, supposedly working on behalf of the farmer. What type of farmer do you mean, right? What is a farmer to you? We have to clearly define that. We need folks to start understanding what the Commodity Credit Corporation is, right? And how they dole out money to the farmer, to the mills, to the refineries, and how that allocation of money is so inequitable on how its resources are put out there. And um, a part of all of that is uh, understanding how those key tactics keep us from things like what I was saying earlier, the community development aspect, right? Because if our communities have no money, if we're being driven from the land, there's no community development, right? If you're pouring money into factories and mills where poor people live in neighboring by areas, but you have no climate action going on, then you're depleting the health of those communities, right? Also, too, land ownership still comes with its voting power, right? We know that you don't have to own land to have the right to vote, but certain down the ballot issues you do, like that USDA County Committeeman who was threatening us on the podcast, right? You have to own land or a farm to be able to vote for him, right? Or to vote against him. So it, it narrows the space of our freedom. And you know, right now we're coming out of a post-election, um, a post-election time period, right? And I know many of us are happy and I know a lot of us understand that that happiness is a band-aid on the real work that has to be done, right? And so, um, you know, there are all these kinds of things that we really need to understand how farming and land ownership really um, give you access to power that is, or empowerment, I'd rather use the word empowerment, that uh, we don't really talk about on an honest, open level, right? And, uh, or a knowledgeable level. So we just hope to create that dialogue around, uh, you know, what ownership and, and farming actually is. And, and I just want to touch a little bit more on the over collateralization. As, as black farmers, that is, that is a huge issue for us. I mean, 
just like for me, for instance, we're close to a 5,000 acre farm, the equipment and the crop itself should cover that, that crop loan. But for black farmers, they want to, you want your house, they want your cars, they, they want your soul if possible. So, you know, for us, we lost our home in 2018. I mean, that is still, still a hard pill to swallow. Every, every morning we get up, because we live in my mom's house now, and I build a house directly behind my mom's. Every morning we get up, that's the first thing we see is our old home back there. And every morning is like, I almost want to shed a tear. Cause I mean, we, we planted every tree there, every flower there we planted and to see it now, how it is the fence. I mean, the, the home is dilapidated. I mean, we even had to call the parish to them, to get them to cut the grass. And when he did send somebody to cut the grass, it was a, a truck full of rebel flags. So that was just like a gut punch. So, to, to get out there, I'm, I'm not going to lie, to get out there and see that, I, I shed a tear there. I mean, I, I cried like a baby there because that's, that's how hard it was for me to see that. So that is the problem now. I mean, and, and our home was lost in foreclosure, in foreclosure, but I have equipment and, and, and cropland still sitting there. You know, one track is worth more than our home. So, and, and it's just sitting there. So that just gives you like what is happening to black farmers mm -hmm. and you know what he's talking about i i want to go back to the heirs property argument when june talks about over collateralization and also putting the onus and responsibility of what's happening with black land uh how it how that how the heirs property argument how i see it as a scapegoat for the usda it is a usda sponsored message right so um one of the things about heirs property, it is a law that needs to be fixed, right? So communities are, are oftentimes, as black folk, we don't have access to proper legal representation. We don't have, how, how are you gonna have access to proper legal representation when you're just trying to pay the light bill, right? When you're just trying to feed your family, those kinds of things, right? Um, or if people are gunning for your land, how are you supposed to worry about certain things or get certain things when it's already set up to when the system's already set up to be against you and with heirs property uh just for like audience description heirs property is when a a when your say your grandparents your family members the head of the households pass away without leaving a will so it leaves this the your property in sort of a state of limbo right and there's no clear ownership and oftentimes what has happened is, is like, especially during the great migration, a lot of us fled the South, right? A lot of our families left. So mom and pop stayed uh, either on the farm or are back on the land, right? And when they passed away, all the kids are gone, right? Or they're scattered everywhere or just trying to hustle and survive their own lives. And sometimes maybe like a property tax issue will come up where the property taxes aren't paid and an unscrupulous land grabber will come in and uh, try to buy the property via property taxes, paying for the back property taxes or something like that. But that again still doesn't address the real issue of land grabbing, right? And one of the things is, is that if you fix that, if you fix that law to where the heirs can get uh, farm numbers for their property, right? When there's no clear title or no clear will, then great. But tell me what happens when that person has their farm number and they're trying to get a farm loan, right? What happens? Now, I just wanna make you aware that you do not have to own land to be a farmer. There's a difference between a farm owner and a farm operator. So heirs property doesn't address any of that. It doesn't address the systemic long-standing discrimination and agricultural lending, right? And it stems, we do nothing, nothing without the USDA, right? And so, um, you know, all of these issues have to be properly addressed and properly talked about. And we need to be very uh, vigilant and we need to be very knowledgeable about how they market these things to us, right? And we need to flip the script and hold them accountable 
for the actions that have taken place. Because like I said, we are in a state of emergency. We have no time for games right now, right? And um, if you are talking, if you are a business or organization or a group and you're talking about sustainability, if you're talking about climate justice and you do not include black farmers in that conversation, you're talking about nothing, right? You're talking about exploitation if you do not talk about us in that conversation. And so, um, yeah, there are so many key points, but the bottom line is access to resources and funds, right? Access to resources and funds. And, um, you know, these things are so, um, these things are so, important to moving forward moving forward in a way that we can um that we can progress and become truly sustainable you know um it's it's really interesting i'm, I'm really glad that you guys shared the connection because i think for a lot of folks understanding black people pushed off their land but also understanding black people being pushed out of a narrative, right? When we, yes. when we celebrate white farmer, white farmer, white farmer, we look at an institution that celebrates farmers, but all I, they're all white farmers, I that's a ratio too. Yeah, I never feel included, even from the most well-meaning white folks at Twitter that I see out there, I never feel included when they're talking about farmers. Mm -hmm. I never feel included, right? Even when sometimes I'm being talked about in the conversation, I do not feel included. And that is by design. That is by design. And oftentimes I'm given this image of what I should be and not who I really am, right? And so, um, yeah, it's just this, this real need for an open and honest, like truthful dialect that's happening. And us being excluded from the conversation. My, my failure should not be your success, right? So, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when you said that failure should not be your success, it's interesting because one thing I do know or I've heard, and I, I could be wrong, but one of the, the, the companies that you're fighting against right now a mill right the um from what i understand is the owners of that mill are direct descendants of the enslavers right uh, uh, and um so it shows that like the inheritance is not just land the inheritance is white so, supremacy and the tactics of it could you imagine living here in the south right there is something so beautifully tragic about where we live, right? But it is our home. And our ancestors have worked so hard to give us this home, you know? And where we live, we're about five to 10 minutes away from the families who enslaved our ancestors. On a day-to-day, -day, like if you think about it, that's, a, that's very uh, traumatic to have to live through that, right? And, but there is something so powerful about saying that we belong here, right? We worked to be here and we will fight for it, you know, um, you know, to the end, right? And that we will pass that spirit on to the next generation. And, you know, I was just thinking, I was think of, thinking about this yesterday, and I was like, man, you know, we really have to focus in, too, on the indigenous folks who have been robbed of their own livelihoods and in, 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 in land here, right? And it's like it's a system, it's a constant system of... Um, of exploitation of robbery and theft and so yeah i mean just thinking about all of those like cultural aspects those real like things that touch at your spirit here 
um, give us a reason for fighting and staying. And with our families, you know, many of us driven from the land, and I say driven, even if you've decided you've gone to college and you've moved away, that is sort of like an insidious driving away as well, right? Because you're going for to better your livelihoods, you're going for more prosperity. But one of the things about us as Black people, our problems will follow us no matter where we go. Because one of the things about America is that it can be the, the policies that governors govern us are inherently racist, right? People practice discrimination with impunity here, right? And so we need to really uh, talk about the effect of when we're driven from the land and what kind of depression and trauma that causes as well. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, there are so many like real deep things that we mm. think about when we're like, this is why we're fighting, you know? It's not only just to get that fair crop loan or to get, you know, to, to, uh, to get some equitable relief, but it's about the spirit and the culture of where we live, you know? And, and we, we decided that we were going to fight. I mean, it, we, you know, we lost our farm, we lost our home, but we didn't lose our passion and our voice. So we was going to use our voice to the best we can and, and, and give a voice to the voiceless. So, I mean, because our, our story is just, it's, it's not isolated. I mean, so many people going through the same thing. So if we can, and we're not trying to be the spokesperson for anybody, but if we can be a voice, that's what we're going to be. We made that decision to fight for our land. I mean, they're not going to drive us away. So we made that decision and, and however hard it is and however hard it's going to be, we, we're going to continue fighting. Yeah. June, um, I think, for some people, it's hard to understand um, how, how systematic it is and how calculated the effort of um, pushing sugarcane farmers off the land. And what I, what I find, and which would be great, and after listening to the 1619 podcast that I, I, I just assume everybody listened to, because if not, go listen. Um, but the, what I think is really important is, could you provide like a simple timeline of like for the for sugarcane production, and then like show how just kicking you off a step, and how it's over years pushing somebody off, and how that results in being pushed off your land. Because I think that's really important for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm getting kind of excited here because because farming to me, y'all, just I want to just just reiterate that farming for me is everything. I mean, it's it's my family's legacy. It's what I love. It's my passion. It's it's my everything, and. To kind of give a quick little synopsis of it, I mean, you need your loan, your crop loan in, in February. And then in February, what, what you start doing is actually you're spraying your crop. And you don't, you don't have a long time period. Your window is very small. So from February to May, you, in those few months, you need to spray your crop, fertilize your crop, spray your crop again. It's not that much work that goes into it but if it's, you're highly mechanized. if you're highly mechanized but you have a small window to do it yeah so if you for instance if you didn't get a crop loan in february if you got your crop loan at the end of march you miss almost two months there so you cannot just go and and spray your crop and fertilize your crop in a week's time that takes a month or two so that that just pushes you back even further so while and your crop needs fertilized like at the time periods. So if you don't, if you don't fertilize your crop within that time period, you're you're behind. Mm -hmm. Your your crop will not progress like it should. So every day that you don't get your crop loan is affecting you. So and it not only affect and, and sugarcane is a perennial crop. So our planting season starts from August to September to October. So you need your crop to be tall when it's ready to start planting in August. So if you're lacking fertilizer, your cane is going to be short. So you can't plant when you want to plant in August. So that delays you. So you're planting way back in October. And the later you plant your cane, the worse stand you're going to get for the following year. So it's, it's a trickle down effect. I mean, it affects you not only this, this year here, but it's going to affect you the following year. For the longest, if you keep that cane, if you keep it for three years, you're, you're screwed for three years. And if you have that same cycle for, for three years, you're doomed to fail. You cannot catch that up. It's not like soybeans where you can regroup 
and plant you a whole different crop that year. So if you have one bad year in sugarcane, that's going to be bad for the next two to three years as well. And that's that's a that's a problem across the board for black farmers too, right? Is getting those late crop loans and having that be to the detriment of your crops, right? So you think about that if you're if you're if you're not getting proper loan servicing on your your crop allowances, then most likely you're not getting proper crop loans or equipment loans for your farm, right? So your farm has a difficult time mechanizing, becoming more efficient, mm -hmm. right? And also too, as we, you miss out on NRCS programs, when that becomes an issue, you miss out on like conservation practices, all sorts of little resources or, or not little, but major resources out there that help to improve the land and improve your crops. Um, and, I mean, like I said, that again is... It, and I just want to go back to okay. the crop again. <laughs> I mean, e even if like, if you don't spray your field in a timely manner, you're going to have a certain grass that's going to come out and you can't control it. So that can overtake your crop as well. So it's, it's so many different things that will, that will just hurt you yeah. tremendously. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you if you plant your crop later than what you're supposed to, every month that you plant later, you lose five tons per acre. So if you're going to average a, a 30 ton crop, if you plant it two months late, you're going to average a 20 ton crop. So that's a 10 ton difference just because your cane wasn't tall enough and you couldn't plant on time. So it's so many different factors that plays into your crop. I mean, it's it's unreal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so June, just to, you know, because this, this struggle where, where they where they were pushing you out was, was over several, several years. So at the breaking point, can you, can you explain like the distance, how many months off you were like, like for <laughs> audiences? For, for example, I'll go 2014. I didn't get my crop loan until June 16th. Yeah. So every other farmer were finished fertilizing. They were in the summer months getting ready to plant August 1st. I am coming in June 16, just getting my crop loan. So after his signature was photocopied to loan documents. So, so if I'm getting my loan June 16, it's not like you can spray your crop, fertilize your crop, all that within two weeks. That takes those three to four months window. That takes that time to do all of that. So if mm -hmm. I'm getting my crop loan June 16, I'm not fertilizing my crop until August. And here you look at every farmer their cane is tall, green, they're getting ready to plant. My cane is short, yellow, full of grass. I mean, you know how embarrassing that was? Somebody that's been farming all of their life and, and, and here I am fertilizing in August. I mean, that's unheard of. The and one a record thing that... farmer, right? Like you got awards for the best farmer, right? Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. yes. I mean, so, farming is everything to me. Every, every, everything, yes. Um, and and I'll see that. One of the things about that, so while like, while someone like June is worrying about getting, uh, you know, at the getting into his crops on a timely manner, and he's knowing that his cane is short, that it's yellow, that everyone's finished fertilizing and all of this, at the same time, he's worrying about losing his home, his car, everything like that, right? Because it's not only the worry about losing your crops, <laughs> right? Um, it's about that full worry of losing your life. And at that same time, we're being stalked. We're being harassed. Equipment is getting vandalized. All of these issues are coming up. And I say this not to say that this is a circumstance only happening to June or myself. This is something that is a real systemic problem that many Black farmers, especially row croppers and ranchers, can speak to because of the amount of money that it in generates, right? And the amount of money that's extracted from that. And so... Um, yeah, and it, it's 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 a real it's a real issue that is going on. The retaliation and reprisal is a real factor for us, and uh, I I think that by actually vocalizing it and saying it to where people hear it, that um, all of you know at Twitter start retweeting it. You know, I want to hear more because once. One of the things that I, I would love for people to understand is that I know for I know that 
politicians don't hit rural America enough, right? Understand that? But mm -hmm. how, imagine how it feels to be rural Black in America, farming here, right? Imagine the outreach that's needed here. And if you can get politicians, if you could get resources to us, forget the politicians, but if you could get resources to us, companies to start investing into our communities, right? That will create real change for everyone, right? It's that idea of caring for the least of us. And so that is, the, that is what we want to communicate. Because like I said, so often we are not part of your conversation and we need to be. And we need to be in your mind and in your thoughts every single day. Because when you're fighting for justice for us and for our kin, you are fighting for everyone, right? Because a system that's based off of exploitation, once we are gone, it will find someone else to exploit. It doesn't, if, even if it's a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a system based off of exploitation will always be that if you, the people don't fix it. You know, I mean, for people to understand the gravity of, of how the countless like threats and trespassing that you guys have dealt with, um, the countless stories that can't even fit into this whole program, right? Like, like the constant recurrence of this injustice. Like, and, and for us as an audience, looking at the two of you and this natural like parent of like such intense love, like you said that, you know, you don't go anywhere without the other. Mm -hmm. that's because of love and it's because of protection right mm -hmm. and that clearly lays out um roles that you play for each other so i think for 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 us it's like what i'd love to hear is like how do you support and protect each other and what are the roles that you guys have created um to, to support one another because it's 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 incredible well i think First of all, I, I, if you, when I have to tell folks, if you're choosing a life partner, make sure that partner is your best friend because you never know what you will have to face, right? And going through this, June and I have become a lot closer. And, um, you know, I would say that for us, it's a lot of prayer and therapy, right? And we're not shy about that. Uh, we pray quite often here. We light candles often. We've always done that. We've always poured libations on the land. We've always done that. Even in our worst circumstances, we've hearkened back to the practices of our ancestors in, in making sure that we are protected and blessed in spirit. But we also have a therapist. We have quite a few therapists that we speak to for various reasons. And Therapy is important. You have to take care of the mental aspect of what happens to you when you're traumatized or victimized. And, you know, June has, he suffers, I suffer from it quite a bit, but I sort of compartmentalize things where June has a great deal of post-traumatic stress that little things can trigger um, that feeling of isolation for him or that feeling of vulnerability, right? Um, a tractor could be passing down our road. Um, a cane truck can be, right now it's harvest season, a cane truck could be passing. And he'll go silent like that, right? And it's a matter of doing like these key things that we've learned, that we've been taught on how to lift each other up and sort of coax ourselves out of that. That is the only key way to be healthy. We could not do that without, um, you know, prayer, therapy, lighting candles, uh, all of those things that bring us sort of inner peace. But I do have to say that what is so healing to us is when people are quite supportive and are on mission and have that same set of values that, that are calling us uh, and saying, hey, we're here for you. Uh, we want to support you. We want to be able not only to support you, but anybody else going through similar circumstances. We want to be able to support them as well, right? Um, we have contracted with a 
a juicing company and a tea company. The juicing company is out of Austin and New Orleans. They're called Boomy Cane Water, right? We contracted with Ellis Island Tea out of Detroit. I mean, just being able to work with like-minded businesses in that way has been a uh, part of that uplifting journey for us as well, right? Having folks like you all come here and say, hey, do you wanna share your story? We're here for you. It's uplifting. And all of those things need to be part of the program of reparations, right? Because, you know, one of the things that I think we don't talk about when we're talking about reparations is that part of reparations has to come with a mental aspect to it too, right? A mental therapy, uh, uh, physical health, um, you know, care, all of that comes with it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, all of those things are part of our healing process and what has helped us. And, and, you know, you always hear that, that saying, well, you know, she's my rib, but really she, she is my rib. I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to go through this without her. I mean, stop smiling, but seriously, I mean, I, I, I really was in a dark, dark, dark place. You know, I, I mean, and I know you might've heard this sometimes in my other interviews. I mean, I, I contemplated suicide because I mean, they took everything I had. So it was nothing left. I mean, that's how I really felt. It was nothing left for me to live for. I mean, my family's legacy was gone. The farm was gone and our home was gone. What was there left? So, and I know you heard the story where I was sitting down in my mom's house. I, I mean, I wouldn't, and I'm an early person. I get up at four or five o'clock every morning. I wouldn't get up till nine, 10 o'clock. And, and I didn't want any blinds open. I wanted the darkest possible. That, that was real life for me. I mean, because it, it's not like you just lost a job. I lost everything, my passion. Forming was me. I mean, that was my identity. I, I love it. And, and when you lose that, it's just like you, you lose part of your life. And she was there for me. I mean, she, she was like, it got to a point like June, get up. You know, like, I love to cut grass. And it's like, the grass was like out of control. It was like those simple things. It was just, you, you know, and it's, I mean, with, without her, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to make it. I mean, it's just, you know, and now like telling the story, it, it's a healing process for us. I mean, it, 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 it really is. And she's right. I, even today though, I still, if a truck passes in front of our road, you know, a cane truck or a tractor, I get quiet. Cause it's like, there goes again, like, okay, why I couldn't be forming right now. Mm -hmm. I should be training my nephews, the next young generation to come up and, and take my place. Like, it's those things that just pop up in your head. It's like, you know, and I always say this, like, you know, you see stories with, with, with old guys, white farmers, 90, 95 years old, you know, Roddy said he never retired. I won't get that chance. You know, and so many of, of other black farmers that, that form here and, and throughout the country won't get that chance. Also Be won't get the chance to like have your dad see you uh, farming crops or, you know, creating a carrying on that family legacy because so many of the fathers in our community have passed away, including June's dad at such a young age. And that speaks to the real uh, physical and mental anguish that, that the effects of racism Put on you right so we should not again glorify the word resiliency and uh, hold people again accountable for the real system of oppression that is going on and I mean we can constantly talk about the issues and problems and I, all the things that are going on but we need to hear more about the solutions right so we can start naming some solutions as to how we fix these problems. And it comes in the form of real reparations. And in those reparations, we need debt forgiveness, right? Instead of passing on generational debt and um, created by a system of discrimination, we need debt forgiveness. And that high burden of proof for systemic racism needs to be alleviated off of the shoulders of black folk. That is such a high burden to carry if you're constantly saying I'm being oppressed, I'm being discriminated against, and either the courts don't hear you or that USDA office doesn't hear you. All of these things are real 
burdensome for us as a community. And in that debt forgiveness, there are specific areas that we need to look at, like those who came out of the Pickford lawsuit, when the debt was supposed to be forgiven back then, that they're still carrying, right? That's going to be passed on from generation to generation, further keeping us from the land and further keeping us from our ability to farm. Because again, remember, you do not have to be a landowner to be a farmer, you know? And so those things are, are really key. And we need real reformation in commercial lending laws, right? So we need real prosecution against those who are discriminating and using abusive practices when it comes to loan servicing. Pre predatory lending should be prosecuted um, with a sense of real damage has to be paid to that plaintiff when, 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 they're, when it's found out that the discriminatory practices have occurred, right? Those things are, are, those things are items we can fight for in policy. Another solution would be for us as consumers to put real pressure on these brands, on these companies, to make sure, again, that if you are promoting sustainability, a uh, healthy food choice, if you're doing all of these things and you're not investing in Black communities, in Black farm communities, then you're really not talking about real change. And we need to hold people accountable for that, right? There are so many things that we can start really getting into the weeds of things and in, in really correcting issues and problems that are there. And, man, there's so much like in my mind right now. <laughs> like there's so much like that I'm thinking about that I want to ask about, but I also want to be sensitive of the time. How are you guys feeling? Um, we are we are doing good. We have a uh, just a few more minutes, but yeah, we're we're doing good. So we have some questions, and and I want to yeah. I want to to allow the community to ask some questions here because um, great. So Julia, will you pull that up? And and while they're saying that, it's like. There's so much that reminds me of like that graphic that that of the iceberg, which is like the tip of it is racism that you see, and the rest of it is the racism that you don't see. And and those that the tractors driving down the road, I mean, those like it's like those are there to remind people and to and to and they're used to frighten individuals. And and I think it's really important that that people recognize how severe that situation is to go through that. And mm -hmm. um, and thank you guys for sharing that. Your, your, the openness of your feelings and, and, and how that's reflected on you. I think that's really important for the community to hear. Um, mm -hmm. From the Farmers Market Coalition, they ask you, um, thank you for sharing your story today. Can you please speak to some of the policy changes that you see as most important to reverse land theft? Yeah, I think that uh, some of the policy issues I think could happen is to increase the amount for direct loan funding, right? So uh, I, th I know that that is one specific key issue uh, that sort of impedes on um, your ability to grow as a farmer, pay your bills, do anything like that, that would help you sustain your livelihood in your land. Uh, also, again, I think that the loan officers that were there proven to be discriminatory during Pickford should not be given uh, the same status or positions that they were doing at that time, right? So meaning that loan officers who were doing wrong uh, or who have, uh, have a pattern of discrimination should not be loan officers either at banks that give USDA guaranteed loans or actually work in the FSA office. Those, are, I think, are two really key factors to start with, right? Because that opens up the door for reformation. And once we get that, then we can go into the different areas and avenues of policies that are there. Another big key point, again, is 
I think that the USDA needs to take its responsibility and hold itself accountable when it lends out money to factories, mills, and refineries that are discriminating against black farmers, right? So you not only have the issue of poor loan funds being given to you or doled out, whatever you want to call it, uh, to black farmers, you not only have that issue, but there's also an issue of when you send your crops to be measured, weighed, and paid out at the refinery or the mill. And your crops are often given a far less weight than that of your white counterpart. So that in turn also uh, ruins your farm or your, your uh, ability to generate income for, for your business. And, um, and I say that the USDA has to be held accountable for this because the USDA, again, is lending out money to these uh, businesses to operate, right? So it's not, they're not just lending money to the farmer, they're actually lending money to the factories that will process your crops, right? And so those are three key things that I think can really open the door for reformation. And it has to be done because if, if those things are not done, we're not working in a sustainable environment, right? We're not working for equity. We have to really ask ourselves what type of society do we want to be and what type of food system do we want to create you know and so yeah i think those are some real key things to open up and and discuss in regarding policy i it seems like you answered the the next question too i mean um but you might want to add something to it so how do you see land grant colleges students and researchers helping or contributing to systemic racism in the USDA FSA. Said. So we have, we have to go back to the Morrell Act, right? And how land grant colleges were allocated funds, right? Our HBCUs get far less money than our typical college, state college, right? And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so especially here in the deep south, because I can tell you that our state colleges, the Ag Center, sometimes has turned a blind eye to us. And yes, that's discrimination. And no, they, by law, they should not be doing that, right? And then when we turn to our HBCU, they can only help us in growing small crops, mm -hmm. right? Like produce. They're not there to assist us in row cropping or uh, large scale farming. And that is by design. Like I said, um, I think that they're, the contribution to systemic racism comes to uh, sponsorship donors and how government funds are allocated to those universities, right? It's a, it's a real web of things of how, how, how all of that contributes to the pattern of racism and reprisal in our communities. I think this is the last question. What next steps do you suggest for someone who wants to work in food justice and rural land rights? I'll be graduating soon and I'd like to work in this field, so I greatly appreciate any advice. Um, well, I can tell you that we need farmers, but not only do we need people to get involved in just the uh, growing of crops, but we also need like agricultural lawyers. We need agronomists. We need diversity in, and inclusion in every single field and sector in agriculture. And in coming into the industry, we need to understand uh, how profitable uh, agriculture is to so many and how, um, how abusive it could be to a lot of us as well, right? So I think that um, just getting familiar with as many black and brown farmers that you can, especially those who are working in a large scale um, and to understand the abusive uh, practices that they've had to fight against, the reprisal that has happened to us uh, I think really hearing us and getting various uh, 
you know, uh, voices on that topic, I think you're, you're set to uh, create some real change. But like I said, it's not only in, in, in the farming, in the, 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 the crop cultivation that we need assistance in, but we need agricultural lawyers, we need agronomists, all of these things where uh, we've been shut out from the industry. And, and, and I would like to say too, you know, before we close this out too, I just want to say that, um, you know, so many good things have, have came throughout this too. I mean, we're, we're actually consulting on our organic farm in yeah, Ghana. Yeah. So that in itself is, is life changing for us um, mm -hmm. to, to consult to grow organic sugar cane in Ghana. I mean, which is amazing. Um, we, we have plans to hopefully start a heritage center. Yeah. Um, and, and dedicated to, to black and brown farmers, um, which our plan is to turn our shop into the Heritage Center, which I'm like super excited for. Uh, I mean, so many opportunities. And, and now like we, we're also growing sugarcane for juicing companies, like for juice water and for a tea company. So, you know, throughout all of this, you know, how can I say that? Throughout all of this is- Hardship. The hardship, there's you know, we- There's been- There's been- Blessings. Plenty of blessings. And, and, and to get to know so many people who have reached out yeah. to us has been amazing. I mean, I have some people message me every every week on Facebook just to see how we're doing. I mean, the, the love that we get from people is, 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 is what's keeping us going. Yeah. And, and, I, and I have to, I also have to say is that if you're really looking to support a Black farmer and you have the platform, you have the resources to help fund that farm or to help keep them on their land, do so. Black farmers need grants and they need gift money, right? They need, we need reparations. And so we are here to say that those ways have, uh, those, that avenue is something that we're finding has worked for us. We've created a GoFundMe where we've been able to organize and, and you know, uh, do things that we would not be able to do otherwise. And, but just that alone is not enough, right? If you're an organization, if you're a nonprofit, if you're a, a corporation looking to invest in black rural communities, um, we need grants and loans and we need your support. We are in a state of emergency again, and real change will take all of us to uh, correct this problem. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. I think everybody needs to follow support, but don't think just following is enough support. Um, there's a GoFundMe here. So if you're watching this on YouTube in the future, still go to that GoFundMe. If you're doing that now, go to that after this episode. Um, Follow them on Instagram, Angela Provost Farm and Jude Raisin Kane. Um, we also share their Twitter accounts. Please, everybody support. And um, before we wrap up with a final comment from the both of you, one of the things that's like been pounding at me during this talk is that like we we look for like we celebrate like this individual um, actions in in this fight right like so it's like oh i can just buy local or i can buy this but like so often the struggle has to be much more collective than that and especially when like the individual actions are only afforded to a certain privileged few and so i think it's really important like to find ways that collectively we can get our hands dirty in the struggle like collectively we can rally and push for this change because as, as the both of you have laid out during this episode, it's, this isn't something small. This isn't something unintentional. This isn't something that, that, should, that should not be at the forefront of everyone's like, minds. Like, this is a sickness that we need to confront and, and we need to fight this. And if you care about sustainability, if you care about regeneration, like, let's try to say the word racism as much as you say sustainability. <laughs> Let's try to say the word inequity as much as you say regenerative, because they need to be confronted because there will be no regeneration without society being mutually regenerative. So let's, let's find a way to work together and to make that happen. And, and everyone, please, 
please support Provost Farm cultivating equity. Let's think about what that word means, what that term means. And I'd love, like, I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you, Angie and June, for, for being here today and, and, and sharing your story, your energy, your passion. I want to give a shout out. I don't know if that's your art or not, but I've seen some of your art and yes. it is unreal. So we all got to understand that, like, Angie actually paints the fields that have been taken away. Mm-hmm. That's got to be incredibly therapeutic, but it's, it just shows that culture is a role for this movement too. Everybody has a place, right? So yeah. I want to give a shout out. Is there anywhere people can see your art too and, 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 and find it and support you in that? Uh, it's sort of just a hobby for me right now. I mean, you can see it on my Instagram page. Uh, it's, uh, I, it's, it's, it like, it's, it is part of that healing thing for me where it's just this hobby. It's, just for me every now and then I'll send one out to someone who's asking for a piece. But I mean, if you're interested, you can message me, DM me on Instagram, if there's something that you see you like. And uh, yeah, but uh, thank you for that. I I appreciate that shout out to my creativity. Oh, do, you, do you guys have any, any, any final words or, should, or are we going to close this out with a, another June um, impersonation of a Keith Sweat song or what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> From, you know, my, I grew up with like my father playing nobody face. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you ain't going to give me the scene today, but no, but, but I, I really do appreciate uh, today. This was, this was amazing though. This, and we, we thank y'all so much for the support. And there are, a few things that I just want to harp on, really. Let's call out not only the USDA, but let's call out these corporations who are using the word sustainability and regenerative ag, but it's not benefiting the Black community. Let's call them out. Let's hold them accountable. Please reach out to different farmers that you know have suffered uh, as a result of reprisal due to the Pickford lawsuit. Please reach out to them, support them, um, you know, and just talk to us, include us in your conversation. And hopefully if that happens, we can set up a real pathway to change and reformation. So and, and also just support. I mean, this this fight is not going away anytime soon. We're gonna be fighting, we're gonna continue to fight. So I mean the support would be great, you know, reach out just to say hello sometimes. I mean, that means a lot to us, so. Yeah. Well, we hope to be able to say hello and and to work together and collaborate in the future. Thank you guys so much. And I also like piggybacking on what you said, Angie, is like, you said something a few times in this this broadcast that that I feel is so important. It's not just representation of BIPOC individuals, but farm workers, people without land. If you care, if you you care about farmers, like, you know, you, 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 you release a film, like kiss the ground, but you don't show anybody who, who doesn't have that ability to kiss their damn ground because it's been taken. It's been taken. Let's, 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 let's let's look at those heroes that don't get recognized all the time that can't afford. Exactly. 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 So much. And, um, please, everybody listening, support, support, champion, um, and and recognize that language is power. Use your words wisely. <laughs> think about what you're saying and think about what that means, right? Mm-hmm. Um, every week we have a different episode. Next week is going to be the final episode of the season featuring um, an amazing group from Puerto Rico. We tune in. It'll be at the same time, and then we'll take in a month and a half off, I think. So please, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, but we need a break over the holidays. And we'll come back with another season of Every Week Food Justice. So we hope that we can check in on you guys both next year. Oh, um, mm-hmm. oh yeah. Definitely. Yeah, we can't, we can't wait to partner up with you all again. This was fun. Yeah, I, I was yeah. amazing. And I want to thank our sponsor, which is Milgram and Dascom Law Firm, who actually in partnership with the grown culture opened up a, a free black farmer legal fund so wow. anyone who's looking for legal support um that 
that is in their wheelhouse, they will jump on and work with you for free as pro bono. We're bringing in more firms together. If we need it, we're gonna make this happen and we're doing everything we can. And as Angie said, it takes all of us. So let's get on it. Um, I appreciate everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. All right, talk soon guys. All righty y'all, bye-bye. Thank you.